Good morning, all. My name is Dennis Archer Jr. and I got the, uh, I'm looking at how long these people's titles are. Mine just says moderator. So that will uh, share uh, the level of importance I serve this morning. But thank you all for being here. Hope you enjoyed the uh, panel immediately preceding us. Let me get right to it because we've got a running clock here. And I'm gonna introduce each of our uh, guest panelists and then I'll ask each of them to just give a little background. And then I'll dive right into some uh, questions. Uh, Randall, good morning. morning. Randall Buckman is the founder and CEO of Emerald Partners. I've got Allison Irritone. You guys sat in order, too. That's pretty good. Well, kind of almost. Kim and Q messed it up. Allison is founder and compliance officer and general counsel for Bloom City Club and Peregrine Manufacturing. Anquanette Sarfo, who a lot of you know as Q, and Anquanette Jameson from her time on Fox 2 is co-founder of Chornaya. And Kim James is the Chief Assistant Corporation Counsel for Transactional and Economic Development Division, City of Detroit Law Department. You win for longest title. <laughs> so, Q, why don't you just give us a little, you know, a couple minute background about, you know, how you got in the space and what led you to be in the space. It's an interesting story. About six years ago, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and I was put on a myriad of drugs, nine to be exact. Um, I felt um, worse after taking those drugs. And um, after the third trip to the hospital for, um, people were eating, so let's just say I, I had um, stomach problems. And um, um, after the third trip to the hospital for that, my husband suggested I smoke a joint. And I smoked a joint and it relieved the nausea, it got rid of the headache, but it also, I found, gave me energy. At that time, I was up to 80 milligrams of Adderall, which if you don't know, is pharmaceutical meth. And um, I took that every day. And I was able to wean myself off of um, um, Adderall and then the other eight drugs. And so now I only use cannabis as, as my disease-modifying treatment for my multiple sclerosis and also to uh, mitigate the, the um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Um, since then, um, I've retired from Fox 2 because I have memory loss caused by uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. And um, about a year ago, my husband and I uh, were working with a partnership, and we opened a provisioning center in the Corktown neighborhood called Botanic. Um, it's in, um, in the process of being um, acquired by a multi-state operator, so hopefully that'll be uh, finalized today. And um, If not, you probably have some buyers in the audience. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually, I want to thank uh, Emerald Growth Partners was one of the... Uh, <laughs> they were in the running, so thank you for that uh, generous um, offer. But... Um, yeah, so um, my, right now my, my husband is, is, <laughs> is, uh, is working on the business aspects and I have, uh, uh, I'm working on more educational aspects and I'm also um, I'm glad to be uh, um, one of the uh, members of the Michigan Cannabis Industry Association to make sure that this uh, industry um, is one that works for everyone. Kim? Uh, good morning. I'm Kim James from the City of Detroit Law Department. Um, so my job is developing policy and regulations uh, in this industry. And I've done land use law for about almost 20 years now. Um, and so uh, I work, uh, so for the, for the past four or five years, I've been working in the marijuana space, developing regulations for the city of Detroit, um, helping the departments implement these policies. And if any of you are operators out here, you may have talked to me on the phone or um, you know, worked with buildings and safety and may have had some issues with process sometimes. So I help with those issues um, as well as uh, uh, manage some of the litigation that um, ensues um, when we disagree. Allison. Thanks. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Allison Ayrton. I'm an attorney by trade. I've been working in the cannabis industry since about 2014. Um, like most, or like a lot of people that got into this industry more recently, it, it was kind of by accident. Uh, this was not, you know, my intention. Um, but it, it's, it's one of those industries that really uh, calls to a lot of people because just like the dot-com boom, this is a new industry um, that, that needs a lot of people to support it. It needs a lot of open-minded people that can see the direct parallels of this industry to any other industry that requires people with skill, dedication, and training to you know, try to solve the big problems that we heard about in the first panel that come with anything that's brand new. 
Um, so I have been working basically in operations um, since 2014 in some, you know, the, the gray market area that Denise Policella referred to during just the MMFLA before provisioning centers were, were you know, made explicitly legal um, in, uh, you know, the, the, the recent MMFLA passing. Um, I also have done applications, and, and there's, there's, there's so much space. You know, a lot of people come to me and talk about, you know, is it saturated, are we done yet? And there really is a lot of, of room um, for even people to get started at this point. I mean, sure that a lot of people have thrown a lot of money at this industry already, um, but there still is opportunity. And, and again, you know, as uh, Denise brought up in her opening remarks, only 120 municipalities have opted in yet. You know, there will be many, many more that do after they see the economic benefit that is inuring to these early adopters. Um, so I think the industry is just going to continue to grow um, and there will be even more opportunity. And it's, um, you know, obviously this is, this is the time to be making some decisions. And, you know, I, I would encourage anybody who has any pull or sway in communities that haven't opted in to go to places like Ann Arbor, go to places um, like Ypsilanti and see the kind of businesses that are opening and how they are bettering the communities and they are not creating the kinds of problems um, that you most often hear from people who have never visited a provisioning center, um, like loitering or crime or you know degenerate people hanging around. It's just not, it's simply not like that. So. I encourage you to go out and visit your local provisioning center if you have never been to one and see what those businesses are like if you um, are, are curious about this industry. Good morning, uh, Randall Buckman, CEO of Emma Growth Partners, a vertical uh, cannabis company in Michigan. I started out in 2009 when I got my first uh, patient and caregiver card. I had no idea what I was doing. I learned slow, not as quickly as I would have liked to have, but I did learn. Um, Care gave up until about 2016, 2017 as legislation was changing. Uh, at that point, I had a, a compilation of assets, opportunities, and ideas. I was very fortunate that I was able to align with a very strong CFO, Daniel Crittenden. Uh, shortly after that, I aligned with a pretty uh, intelligent attorney standing in the back there with the shiny top, Benjamin Sobchak. Uh, since then, we've crafted our company into a um, formidable uh, player in the game. Thank you. So, Kim, as I look across the room, um, I'm happy to see the diversity that's here. Uh, the industry as a whole, uh, as I've seen it develop, uh, is not as diverse as this room is. So I applaud the chamber for pulling together a diverse group of uh, participants here. But Detroit is 85 to 88 percent African American. Um, and I know it's important to the administration and other facets of opportunities that the citizens of Detroit are able to participate. What are you guys doing from a policy side and from a legal side to ensure uh, and encourage uh, the city's majority to be involved in the space? Sure, thank you so much for asking that question. So the city of Detroit's been regulating marijuana um, caregiver centers, facilities, and now establishments since about 2015. And involving Detroiters who may not have the same access to capital as others who may come from other states and things like that has been an essential component to um, our program and something that we're trying really hard to do. And so in the new adult use law that passed by the voters last November, there's a social equity component that requires um, the state, or mandates the state to give uh, special opportunities to those who may come from um, communities that have been uh, disproportionately impacted by marijuana enforcement. So Detroit is one of those communities. And so um, you may be aware, if you follow the city council, that there is an opt-out ordinance that has been introduced by the Detroit City Council. But I want everyone to not worry because it's only until January 31st. Um, it will go into effect or it will be voted on next week. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure that we get the social equity component right um, in the ordinance that's eventually passed to allow the new um, uh, adult use establishments. So it is a real important factor for um, the city, for the administration, for the Detroit City Council, especially uh, Council Member James Tate, who is the uh, council member who's going to be sponsoring the ordinance. Randy, talk about, um, you guys are vertically integrated. Uh, talk about 
the business opportunities from perhaps a supplier standpoint. You know, if you look at, for instance, the automotive industry, and obviously that's our most mature industry here, and you look at all the spinoff opportunities in the supply chain, tier one, two, three, and then the service opportunities, much like the services uh, Allison are providing, what are the, some of the business opportunities that you see evolving out of this for people that may not want to be directly in the space, but that you'll need to service your business? Well, I think some of the uh, strongest uh, winners here would be the law firms. I think they're all doing very well. There's a lot of campus attorneys these days. Uh, accounting firms, uh, we're, we're relying on professional services that uh, previously a lot of cannabis uh, industry people did not use. Now it's more commonplace. And when we make phone calls to accounting firms, they take our meetings, actually reach out to us. Uh, insurance companies, 401k, um, they're all reaching out to us. And then if you go to packaging, um, there's a tremendous amount of money that we spend on packaging, branding, creative, um, shirts, and different uh, things that we give away as uh, swag for our um, advertising, uh, going to advertising, different companies that we're working with, billboard companies, learning that whole world. Um, we're very limited on, as to where we can advertise. We have to pick out the right spots and then you know try to go after them. And then since it is so limited and there are a lot of cannabis companies with a decent amount of money, I find myself in uh, almost bidding wars for marketing positions um, with the competition. But there's definitely opportunity. A lot of uh, hires that we've been bringing into our company have no previous cannabis experience, uh, but we're hiring you know, we HR. Uh, we need a controller, um, compliance officers. They're not from the cannabis industry, but they do have those expertise from different areas and are able to, to come into the industry, get a you know, higher pay than they were previously, and be an asset to our company. It's fantastic. Can you talk about your customer? I've had the benefit of working with some of the different firms in town, um, Common Citizen being one, and I know that I just met in moving around with some of their principals, some, I mean, incredible people with amazing stories. Uh, a woman that's got five tumors and five kids, and but for um, cannabis, you know, would not be able to function. Um, another young lady that was, had been sexually abused multiple times and was dealing with that mentally, and the, and, and the, the use of cannabis in a medicinal fashion has really helped. Talk about, because I think that people who are not familiar with the space and not, don't really understand that, you know, in many instances, these are patients, for real. I mean, not everyone's going in there just to get high for the weekend. So talk about the different type of customer that comes into your establishment. The people who come in to get high for the weekend, they are actually helping to pay for the medicinal patients like myself. And Allison, I'm so glad that you mentioned, please come to a provisioning center. I tell people all the time, everywhere I go, you don't have to have a card to come into Botanic, at least. Um, I know some places are very strict about that, but if you do not have a card and you just want to see what goes on in a provisioning center, we have visitor's passes. We have badges, you can come in and you can see what goes on because it's not this drug den that people tend to think it is. Um, our, our average customer our, our, our average customer is probably um, a woman, most likely. 50% of women, by the way, um, indicate that they use cannabis for anxiety and PTSD issues. By the way, anxiety is not a qualifying condition in Michigan. So right now you have people who are using this medicine off-label. So the average customer that I have is really someone who is about maybe 62 years old, most likely dealing with arthritis, and really just wants a topical or a tincture that is non-psychoactive, but has more than the 0.3, the arbitrary 0.3% uh, THC. Um, because by, by the way, if you have a, a significant condition, um, chances are 0.3 hemp-derived THC or CBD isn't going to necessarily help. But I digress. The average uh, patient is, um, is, somewhat, is a mature patient. Um, also, studies have found that uh, been using cannabis use, um, older people extend their, um, their participation in the workforce. So the, it makes them better employees. The average person um, comes in, they really just want help sleeping. Um, everyone is, is having a hard time sleeping. And if I can say, look, just call, take this candy bar, because usually it's just a candy bar, five milligrams of THC an hour before you uh, go to bed, and you will have 
the best sleep. And you will wake up and you won't be high. And you will be a more productive employee the next day. Um, when people realize that, and I wish the people who would, um, if you are in the position to make policy for your companies, the people who make zero, to, uh, po zero tolerance policies, please, I will give you a joint. Um, please, go home and smoke that joint and then go to bed and then go to work the next day and tell me if you are still impaired because chances are you're not. Chances are you're a better employee. So my average customer is um, a woman who's dealing with anxiety, um, a, a man who um, is dealing with arthritis or um, hip replacement or knee surgery, um, and, or people like me who have multiple sclerosis and who are dealing with persistent muscle spasms. Um, lots of cancer patients who um, are trying to supplement their chemotherapy because you don't have to choose chemo or, uh, or cannabis. You can use both. <laughs> and, and people are doing that successfully. So, and yeah, you have the recreational people who um, don't want to drink and get crazy. Instead, they want to go home, maybe eat a gummy, maybe smoke a joint, and, and watch Netflix. Um, <laughs> we, they, they tend to be a pretty chill group. You need to be back on TV. <laughs> I'm just passionate about this. Allison, a, a lot of uh, people are speculating whether, uh, from a national political standpoint, that uh, this administration, this president, will push to legalize federally sometime uh, in advance of the forthcoming election to try to trigger some additional support. What's your opinion on whether or not that happens, and how does uh, this business being legally, being legal federally, affect business in the state of Michigan? Um, that's a really good question. I, we have a, a representative in, from Ann Arbor, but you know, importantly from Michigan, um, that sits on the National Cannabis Industry Association at the federal level, and they have a full-time lobbyist. And there was a lot of speculation that Donald Trump might just, you know, by executive order or something else, you know, late August next year, um, legalized cannabis to get some, you know, uh, liberal votes his way. I, I don't personally know anybody who's in favor of this that would flip a vote to Donald Trump just for that reason, but um, it's speculated. Um, I have no idea if that'll happen because he changes his mind, like, you know, underwear. So um, we have no idea if he'll do that, but I, I don't know if that would have the effect that he intends it to have. But importantly, um, there is a lot of discussion because a lot of multi-state operators, um, you know, it, it's a huge deal to them, you know, is cannabis all gonna be grown in North Carolina like tobacco or South Carolina and then shipped to other states? And sort of the consensus in the industry right now is that every state is, is, is going to be protective of the industries that they've built state by state. If there is, you know, millions and millions of dollars of investment and in cultivation in Michigan, nobody's going to just allow interstate commerce. I mean, any attorney in here knows interstate commerce cases are long and complex. They're not just gonna start saying, okay, Oregon, ship us all your excess product, and you know, North Carolina is the perfect climate for growing it. I have no idea if it is. Um, you know, but now you're gonna be the supplier to, to, the, to the country. I mean, maybe 20 years from now, as it matures, it will go that way. But the, the consensus is that every state is going to want to protect the infrastructure and, and investment that they have in their state programs. And interstate commerce, I think, is, is a long way away, just like alcohol. I mean, every hamlet, every state, every town sort of had their own alcohol laws after prohibition, and some of those are still around. So, um, I, I mean, that's my best guess. And while I have the microphone, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to you know, sometimes it's about um, changing people's perceptions of this industry. Um, and, and one thing that we're going through at Bloom with a lot of new provisioning centers opening in the state, um, you know, there's kind of this, this minimum wage that has been set for bar, uh, bud tenders, which is basically the retail sales associates. And it seems to be about $20 an hour. So for anybody who thinks that these are low paying retail jobs, they're not, they're $20 an hour jobs. Um, these are good jobs that aren't going away because most retail, like we're seeing people from Dick's Sporting Goods, from Verizon, these are all things you can buy online and Amazon, Amazon can ship to you. You can't order cannabis from Amazon. So these are retail yeah. businesses yet. But, but for now, you know, these are $20 an hour jobs that aren't going away. You know, this is revitalizing retail. 
because you can't get it online. You can get delivery, but you still have to order it from a provisioning center. So um, this industry, at least in the, in the you know, for me, I, the next five years is gonna look very similar, perhaps, to the way it looks now from, from an employment standpoint with high wages and you know, rewarding those people that are diligent and you know, get the knowledge, like, like Q was mentioning. Um, you're talking to people about their health and you're talking about complicated um, you know, situations. It's, it's akin to buying a very high-end running shoe when you're talking to people about their gait. I mean, this is not just like come in, buy a joint, and walk out the door. There's, there's you know, half an hour conversation that accompanies, or more, that accompanies every sale. So these are skilled jobs, and, and they do pay well. Randy, talk about, uh, let's talk about the capitalization of these businesses. Uh, Early on, you had a lot of the significantly high net worth um, individuals in town throwing a lot of money at this to try to get ahead of the game. Now you have more institutional entrepreneurs getting involved, having to go out and trying to raise capital either from that high net worth community family offices or some of the institutional organizations. Without obviously uh, delving into your sources of uh, investor base, Talk about the process. Has it been difficult? You know, any suggestions? Again, not directing them to a particular institution, but a pathway to raise capital. Um, I'll be a little transparent about where my capital came from. I'd say my first million came from investors uh, in Michigan. Um, after that, uh, my second significant jump in capital came from uh, an investor out of Miami, um, who also paired me with my CFO. Uh, his background was, Dan's background was Canaccord, which is a brokerage firm in Toronto, uh, which did a lot of the, the IPOs for Canadian cannabis companies, which obviously Canada is a little bit further ahead of the US. Um, so we had a pretty good understanding of the capital markets at that point. Um, and he had brought a tremendous amount of connections. The Canadian investors did make a lot of money prior to the US catching up, and then they were able to take that money rolled into the US market, knowing that it's the next market that's gonna boom. And that's where a lot of our big MSOs have come from, and they're backed from Canadian companies. Um, since then, we did a Series A that compiled of, I believe, a few different hedge funds that came in, and then a number of other smaller investors. Uh, we do also do stock options for our employees. We want everybody to invest in, be invested in our company um, and be a part of the culture. If, if we're doing well as a company, they're doing well. They want to see the company win. It's not just the people at the top that are eating you know, the, the largest plates. It's everybody's eating together. That's fantastic. Kim, if you, if you look around uh, the state, um, there are a lot of lawsuits. And there are a lot of um, municipalities who thought they had processes in place that are being held up now because of these lawsuits. You have done an outstanding job shepherding the city's process along. Um, you know, what did you guys do differently that has had to be a pretty smooth process? Well, maybe we just don't talk about it much because we probably had at least 50 lawsuits. Um, oh, over... you kept that really low. Key. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about the first one because it's kind of a funny story. Um, so one of the main, one of the essential components to any economic development program for a government is getting your taxes. And so when you're dealing with a cash business, it's really hard, especially before the Facilities Act came online, it's really hard to track where income is. And as you may know, City of Detroit is an income tax for uh, anyone who works here or lives here. So um, when we first passed our first caregiver uh, ordinance regulating facilities and tried to, you know, we started with a landscape of about 300 that were operating essentially illegally, we wanted to be sensitive to the fact that people were trying to do these businesses, but you know, you needed to respect the process. And so when we passed our first ordinance, we got sued by about a group of maybe 15 uh, dis dispensaries that were operating illegally, and we go through, you know, we start litigation, and um, the judge is really doesn't have a good sense of the law, so she says they're allowed to operate. The Marijuana Act lets them do that. We disagreed, but we said, okay, judge, um, 
let us get some discovery. So the judge said, sure. So we sent them some requests for, to admit, a request for production of documents, and we asked them for all of their tax returns for the past three years. Because they, it, they claimed they had been operating all this time, they had these you know, grandfathered rights. And so once we did that, no one wanted to give us their taxes, and so they dismissed the lawsuit. So things like that um, sort of happen all the time, and then we get to the court, and then we find um, maybe they don't, you know, take us, uh, they, they, they sort of will back down sometimes when they don't want to disclose information to the city. We've gone farther along now. Um, our main litigation at this point is based, basically zoning appeals when people are denied and then they take that to circuit court. Some people have been very successful at that and some haven't. Um, it just kind of depends on how the, basically the, the record and the facts that support your case. A uh, question for both Allison and Randy. Um, an update on what's going on with the banking legislation and you know and I think everyone here there's a you know there's a bank over here or a credit union over here that's doing this or that but overall what's the status of things with banking sure I can go first um, <clears throat> so as at the Senate the you know the house obviously at a federal level um, approved the the safe banking act as Denise was referring to in her opening remarks I have no idea what the Senate's go going to do, especially with impeachment. Um, it's anybody's guess. Um, you know, I know that we're at a critical mass. I mean, 33 or 35 states have medical programs, so you know, anybody voting against um, banking for cannabis at some point, if, if it doesn't pass, is voting against their own state's interest. Um, so it, it probably will, I mean, I would assume it it will pass unless they want to put something in it that people just absolutely object to and it'll go back to the house. So it's really, I mean, what, 50-50? I have no idea. But um, it's, it's really, uh, I used, I've lobbied a, in DC since 2015 on this issue and this is the closest it's ever gotten, but I thought it would be here two years ago, so I'm not a good predictor. But locally, um, you know, Live Life Credit Union in Southfield, Dart Bank in Lansing, um, both offer services, but they're not cheap. So when you think that, you know, cannabis is this cash cow business, the operating expenses in cannabis are huge. Without being able to deduct ordinary and necessary business expenses, and with bank fees that run you $3,000 for the application and $500 a month, three to 500 a month, just to have a bank account, we are facing real challenges just trying to break even in a provisioning center until some of these rules change. So banking is available, but it's very expensive. Um, as Allison said, I, I also had, do not have a, a great idea as to when the Banking Act will pass uh, the Senate. I had, have had conversations with different people that are usually influential and pretty intelligent, um, and they think potentially in December or January that'll pass uh, locally. Um, as she pointed out, Live Life, which is in uh, Sterling Heights, I believe a lot of the a lot of the major companies use Live Life. We use Live Life. Uh, Dart Bank is also in Mason uh, County. Dart Bank was a little more expensive uh, up front initially. Uh, Live Life was a little bit more reasonable. However, I believe they just tightened the rates to close that gap, which is economics, um, unfortunately. Uh, we have not had issues with banking at, on the front end as far as working with Live Life. They've been great. Um, I would like to see banking pass so that we are able to look for different lending options versus going for higher interest rates through different REITs or uh, private equity sources. Uh, the downfall with banking, um, when it does open up, you're going to bring in a lot of uh, institutions that have kind of been sitting on the sidelines wanting to get into the industry. And there's already conversations of you know, smaller players that want to get into the industry in Michigan and other states uh, and their concerns about not being able to compete. Uh, well, we're a pretty finance, well-financed, capitalized company, and I'm concerned that when major, major corporations come in with multi-billions of dollars that have just been waiting to get into the industry, it's gonna be a lot more competitive. And that's the, the, the give and take with banking going through. There's pros and cons. And I just wanna add, because we have like a minute left, uh, that the banking issue does not just affect the business aspect of it. Um, I have had two personal banking accounts shut down even though I have not deposited one cent of cannabis money into either of these accounts. Um, they, uh, Lake Michigan Credit Union, by the way, which is a Michigan-based credit union, closed all of my personal accounts, um, even though they have my mortgage, by the way, and will not 
um, uh, allow me to take out a second mortgage on my home, which the state allows you to take out a second mortgage, to use a second mortgage as your capital requirements, by the way, to get a license. I was not allowed to do that from, from my bank because they said that I may take the money and invest it into my cannabis business, even though I had no legal obligation to do that because I have an investor. So banks are cut, and, and that was like Michigan Credit Union, and then a month later, Chase also closed my personal bank accounts. So um, that's a huge problem. And again, they say it's just because of my involvement in the industry, not that I've put any money in any account. Just my involvement alone has, has kicked me out of two banks' personal accounts. Wow. Okay, don't put that on Twitter. <laughs> I know, I'm just, yeah, my, my next bank may cut right. me out, so I'm trying to like. Let me just say, we got 10 seconds left. Um, you guys have been phenomenal. Uh, unfortunately, because of the tight schedule, we don't have time for Q&A, but I think everyone's sticking around. So if anyone wants to have uh, any further conversation with our panelists, they'd be happy to do so. And let me just say that um, I think that the chamber pulling this together is fantastic. I, when, when people think of a chamber, uh, they think of you know, a bunch of old white guys in suits who are bankers and, you know, uh, in, in these b big businesses around town. But the chamber is doing a good job of trying to embrace new economies. And I actually encourage the entrepreneurs that are here to embrace the chamber because Michigan and Detroit in particular is, has a significant, obviously, uh, manufacturing background. And to be able to couple the experience of some of these very mature, historic, brilliant companies with the innovative entrepreneurial spirit of the people getting into this space, it could be a great collaboration. So I, you know, thank you again to the chamber. Thank you, panelists. And we have an eight-minute break now until the next session. So stretch your legs.